All right, perfect. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to March 10, uh, 2022 of uh, Parker Office Hours. Um, as previously mentioned, we have a CNCF code of conduct in place for this project as well, so be excellent to each other. And I think the first thing on the agenda <laughs> is right away me. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to, to announce a new mode, um, which is called the scraper only mode, and I can give a little demo. Um, so basically, uh, Parker is able to, to take profiles from, from uh, any uh, Parker agent and have those be sent to, to itself and then ingest those um, into, into storage work. Describing the other way around, there are many Parker agents that generate profiles from eBPF or with eBPF, and then those uh, eBPF profiles are sent to a central Parker instance uh, where they are ingested. So I think it's a bit a better approach of explaining that. And then the last missing missing piece now was to to have a mode where not only we can use eBPF to generate these formats, but have a mode where Parker uh, can scrape pprof endpoints like it used to, but you can deploy this on multiple machines and then the pprof profiles will be scraped and then sent off to a central place um, uh, with kind of like a scrape only mode uh, approach um, in, in Parker. So I quickly want to show what it roughly looks like. Um, so I do have, uh, which terminal do I need to share? I think this one. Um, so I do, do have Parker um, compiled locally. Uh, it's in the local folder bin Parker as a binary. And because I'm already running Parker on localhost 7070, I need to run it on 7777, some different port. And then I want to say that uh, we want to run Parker in scrape only mode. So it won't start the, the database or anything like that. It will just start scraping pprof endpoints and then forwarding these profiles to um, to a remote Parker uh, instance, which is whoops, described here. And since it's just localhost, we, we use insecure. So if I start this, it will say running Parker in scrape mode. And we can let that running for a bit. Um, we can, let me quickly grab this. We can, however, so let's at these, we can also add external labels so that the concept you might be familiar with from, from Prometheus. So every profile will automatically be also uh, getting a label called foo equals bar now and node equals metamatsu desktop, which is my machine, before they are being sent off to a different Parker instance. So let's say you have like a Kubernetes cluster and you run this Parker scraper mode on, on every uh, node so you can like automatically label all the instances with that node name, for example, something like that. Um, so let's go to that local Prometheus, uh, Prometheus uh, Parker instance. Um, it's not showing me, ah, I think I didn't click on tap that window. So there is Parker. And if we go in here, we can see that we are indeed scraping something uh, by default. But additionally, we can also, when going into, uh, let's say, the uh, memories in use objects, we also now see, let's make this, let's just zoom in like that. Um, we also now see another instance in, in orange, uh, which is a, the different or the other um, um, Parker instance that is scraping, I think the same, yeah, it should be scraping the same Parker instance, like the one that actually ingests data. So they are like scraping both the same instance, but the orange one is coming from the Parker agent, which uh, previously um, wasn't really possible. So um, I guess I can make this slightly more interesting and quickly change, change the other one to, to scrape uh, Prometheus. So it's a bit more obvious that we are like seeing different things. So I'm just changing the part uh, in the config of Parker. And then hopefully um, in just a couple of seconds, we start seeing Prometheus data. Any questions so far? Let's 
see. Yeah, there we go. So there's there's now um, the this job equals default is from from that uh, Parker instance that has the database, etc. And then this one here is uh, actually coming from another Parker instance that uh, only scrapes Prometheus now. So yeah, we can we can have different um, Parker instances that basically just forward these profiles uh, going forward. All right. Anything you want to uh, add, Frederick? It's the Very cool. I, I was just thinking maybe it, it could even be cool if we could, like, the, 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 the scraper only mode won't really, the, the name won't make sense in, anymore if we do this. But I was just thinking if it could make sense to even configure Parka agents to send it to what is now a scraper only mode one. Um, and have that kind of batch things up and send it off um, uh, to to the like central Parka storage. Um, I don't know, just just a thought. Maybe it could make sense in the future, especially because we were thinking of slightly re-architecting the Parka agent, right? Because um, uh, to kind of take profiles of the entire host, not of individual containers only. Um, and in that case, it might start to make sense to automatic, so to only once in the entire Kubernetes cluster, watch all of the metadata and not per node. Um, so that we, that, uh, for when we um, attach metadata to profiling data. Just a yeah. thought, I, I, I don't know. No, it makes perfect sense. And I'm, I'm kind of like smiling and laughing because uh, on Twitch, uh, where I started to implement this uh, with the community, someone pointed out, why don't we just add this uh, pprof scraper mode only to the Parker agent as well? Um, so I think in that sense, you're right, that if we ever uh, re-architect the Parker agent, I think it makes sense to, to have service discovery and just the Parker agent and then batch everything. So we could basically scrape pprof endpoints, but we can also kind of like combine the uh, the profiles being sent off to the central instance with um, with the eBPF based profiles and then it really doesn't matter from there and we can ju just send things off um, I yeah. Don't know. yeah the the, the the reason why I was thinking about this is because like we know from like the Loki project that eventually like list watching from every single host on your uh, in your Kubernetes cluster might not scale particularly well. We do watch quite a lot less than the Bloki project does, but um, I, I imagine that it's still, you know, it's still n nodes um, that we create uh, at least a pod list watch. We are limiting it to the, the node only that it's on. So we're doing our best we can to make, to make it, to make the overhead as little as possible, but it like, it, it could be possible that always like not even watching the Kubernetes API at all from the agents could make sense and only say like it was this container with this ID, uh, which we can find without watching Kubernetes things and then send it off to Parka um, server ingestion only mode. I don't know exactly what we would call it. Um, and there, because it would see, okay, this is, it, it was this container. So um, I know this metadata about this container. We only need to watch the entire, uh, like we only need to watch the metadata API even once. I don't know. I, I think we should only worry about it if it actually becomes a problem, but just a thought. Nevertheless, this is super cool and super important. We've, we've known that people wanted this for a very long time. I think the, the like five minutes after you opened this, Ben Ye <laughs> commented on the on the pull request and was saying how awesome this is. Yeah, we we had this previously in Conprof, but then it got dropped along the migration to Parker. So yeah, it's definitely worth having. Um, but yeah, like everything you said makes sense, and um, yeah, I can I can I can see uh, the improvements when kind of like combining or when having the metadata just once and then combining wherever, like however we need 
to combine. Pretty cool idea. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, I'll unshare. And then uh, next on the agenda uh, is Frederick, the columnar store update. All right, so I wanted to give an update on the columnar store. So we're, we've, we've made a ton of progress. And um, if you've checked out the branch, it does actually build, you can actually run it. Um, it won't last particularly long because it's, it is still um, in progress. But um, as of yesterday or the day before, we now have various encodings even. even. So we have like run length encoding, we have like dictionary encodings um, and everything that Parquet basically supports because um, that's kind of what I'm getting at. We actually ended up not implementing our own custom in memory format, but actually we're basically reusing uh, the Parquet format in memory, um, which is very convenient because it's also the format that we happen to want to use for um, persisting this data. Um, but Parquet itself is actually Parquet itself is actually um, has a couple of things that our initial proposal didn't um, didn't allow for, and this is something that I wanted to show today. Okay, so let me I've, I've prepared a couple of slides because I think it's a little bit easier uh, to understand that way. I believe you can see my yep. slides. All right. So um, just uh, kind of going back, um, like stepping one uh, step back, we, we're doing all of this uh, because the hypothesis essentially is that with columnar, sto uh, columnar store, we are able to um, achieve essentially, you know, we, we, we don't have to limit ourselves in terms of cardinality in any way. Um, and we've seen this with other observability products. Um, so this is not a, not a wild um, statement to make, but um, there are, there's one particular thing that we laid out in, um, in this RFC that no other columnar store um, supports, uh, at least none that are accessible to us um, right now or in open source, um, which is the, this idea of dynamic columns. And you can think of dynamic columns very similar to if you're familiar with Prometheus labels, that every time we see a label name for the very first time, that's when we create a new column. Um, and this, um, wh while this might make sense in a lot of sense in an observability kind of context because of the tooling that has been popular for the last couple of years, um, it's not necessarily um, a typical thing in like relational databases. Relational databases tend to have a very strict um, schema um, and you can kind of uh, break out of that. It, it tends to be either entirely schemaless or super strict in terms of schemas. And we're, we're kind of in between here where we know exactly what type and encoding and everything these dynamic columns are going to have, but they need to be dynamically created whenever we see a label for the very first time. And um, this is very creatively named is where we kind of, I've been working with a bunch of people who um, originally created a parquet library um, at segment. And uh, using this library, um, I essentially introduced a new package, not in, the, in that library, but only, only in uh, Parker for now, because it kind of, only supports a subset of Parquet features for the for the time being, but it essentially introduces what I just said, and uh, I wanted to walk you through very quickly um, how this works. And so, uh, on a very high level, um, all of this is kind of pseudo code, so don't uh, take this um, as you know exactly what uh, what you're going to find in the in the in the Go code. But um, on a high level, this is kind of how how it works. You define this high level schema where you're saying um, like the columns that are not dynamic. So in this case, for example, our timestamp and value columns, they are not dynamic. So 
these columns will always be there no matter what. However, labeled is a dynamic uh, column. And so every time we see a label name for the first time, that's when we, we will dynamically create a um, column. And so let's take this example that we have. This is probably a very, very typical Kubernetes environment. We have container, namespace, node, and pod uh, label names, right? And then the, the kind of runtime, the dynamic schema after we know these label names um, looks like this runtime schema that I noted here. Uh, and as I said, the parquet, this is kind of exactly the parquet schema that is being used. We kind of off of the um, like flexible or dynamic schema, we generate an actual parquet schema. Um, and then we at runtime actually use that. So um, that, however, brings a couple of problems with it. Um, primarily, when we read data, um, it, it, we have the possibility that there are distinct um, runtime schemas, right? So um, fortunately, because we have kind of this semi-structured or semi-schema uh, full, I don't know if that's a word, but um, <clears throat> schema, we can actually ensure that while the schemas aren't identical, they're not conflicting either. And so I've got this example here, and I'm sorry that it's really, uh, really small with the font in the, in the top, um, kind of tables. Um, I just wanted to get this into one picture. Um, in, in this case, we have uh, three tables uh, that have different schemas. So the first one, and you can imagine that there are many rows in these. I just, for simplicity reasons, uh, made it a single row per, per table. Um, the first table we have only has seen the um, container and namespace labels. And then, as I said, the timestamp and value um, columns are always there. Then the second one has only seen the namespace and the pod label name. Now, this might not make sense if you're familiar with Kubernetes, but um, it's just in order to uh, demonstrate the, the mechanism. Um, and then again, we've got the timestamp and the value columns. And then the last one, we only have seen the node label. And when we actually merge them. Um, and what, one, one other thing that's really important to remember from the RFC, everything except for the value column is a, so, uh, is a column that we sort by. And so that means that when we merge data like this, we can actually definitively say what is the smallest row, right? And then every time we take the smallest row and that's how this entire like result merged table is built um, at this this only happens at at read time um, and at comp compaction time um, so in this case uh, the very last thing that's important about sorting um, the way that we configured this particular table is that nulls are smaller than um, non-null values and that this we can see immediately on the first row that we have here um, so this, this one came from table number three, right? Um, it, it had only seen the node label so far. So in the result, we have kind of the union of all of this, the dynamic columns that we've seen across all the tables, but those columns that weren't available in the original table three, um, all of those com columns are just replaced with kind of you can think of it as uh, virtual uh, columns or virtual pages. That's actually kind of what the real implementation is like. Everything here is kind of laid out in, in pages and everything that just didn't exist before is just virtual null, null pages. Um, so that's why we're seeing nulls here. Um, and then all of the values. And then the next one, right? Um, we know that um, the container label is the smallest label, right? Um, we sort the labels themselves also in order. Um, and so the second table 
didn't have the container label. And so this is a null value again. Hence, this one is smaller than the last row. And so that's kind of, I, I guess you're, you're already understanding and seeing um, how this works. And this is the, the entire scheme of how, um, how reading works. And as I already mentioned, not only at reading time does this work, but whenever we need to read all data um, kind of um, in sorted order. So that's the case whenever we do compaction or whenever we're going to be ready to write it to disk, all of these kinds of things. So yeah, that's uh, what I wanted to talk about today. This is something that we finished up, I think about two days ago. Um, and yeah, now we're kind of just working on a couple of performance improvements. And um, right now we still kind of infinitely write all of this data to in the in-memory buffer. So we now need to also implement some mechanism that either flushes this to disk or, you know, because it's uh, all behind the feature flag, we can just throw this data away um, and then start over. Um, and then afterwards implement that we flush it to disk or something like that. Anyways, that's that's it uh, that I wanted to uh, update you all on. Any any questions on this uh, mechanism? If not, I can give a quick demo of all of this. Definitely have a question, but if others have a question, then I'll go last. <laughs> Let me go back. Okay. I guess um, my, my question was that, um, so if we sort all the uh, labels first by their name, like container, namespace, node, pod, uh, we we do know those up front, um, I, I guess, or do we like scan through everything and then and then build this list of, of labels from that? Like that's the uh, part I haven't seen so far in code. So I'm really That's a good question. So um, what, what we do is, with every buffer, we attach um, kind of a description of the dynamic labels that its schema was created with. And so whenever you read um, a table, it's kind of self-descriptive about um, what its own dynamic columns are. And when you merge it, um, we kind of map the column back to the original one um, because because we know from each we know from the merged table what the kind of resulting dyna dynamic columns are and we also know what the original dynamic columns were and that's how we can kind of map the index even back to the original column okay and then once we have like all the label uh, names we can sort them and then we really just need to Per label name, uh, as you said, we know where these buffers or which um, buffers had these labels. So we can kind of like look at the values and then sort by those um, first and then go one by one. Um, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Ba basically, we, we built the result schema and then we check in each of the mm -hmm. original tables. Did this column exist? Did this column exist? And so on. And if it didn't exist, then we return this like null yeah. column um, that basically doesn't use any memory, just says, just returns null. Right. And I imagine like these null uh, columns are going to be dropped in, I guess, in, in the UI later on. That's why I would imagine that they aren't really that important for the user, but we kind of like need to, to have like a fixed schema, at least for like within a response and then we can uh, drop them in the UI or something like that. So uh, I don't think from the from the UI perspective anything will change. Um, whenever a column is read where there is a label name but no value, that's like in Prometheus. Whenever you have a label that has a non-existent value, it's like or an empty value even, it's equivalent to this label not even existing at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it'll be already be filtered out by that point. Nice. Yeah. At least for me, it was a really good rundown of, of how this works with the dynamic uh, columns.
any other questions people have? It's pretty advanced, so don't be afraid to ask something <laughs> that seems obvious. Yeah, just, just for just for a little bit of context, actually, the team also asked um, <laughs> for me to to give a um, an explanation of this. So uh, that's why we're doing this, among other things. Right. Um, I guess. Yeah. The, ah, you wanted to give a quick demo, right? Sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> you know. It's kind of uneventful because it's um, it just works. <laughs> looks looks the same as uh, as like Parker off of Maine right now, um, with a few small things just that just haven't been implemented yet. But you know, overall, you can see we can. Um, we can list our um, profile names just like in the previous uh, state. We can select CPU samples. We can read them. We can merge them. All of these things. And um, I, I actually haven't uh, done a benchmark yet because there is a there are a couple of unfair comparisons be uh, between uh, current main and this one in particular. One of the things that this storage currently still does, and that's what I'm working on right now, is it still reads through all data that was ever written whenever you do a query. Um, and obviously that's not desirable. Uh, so something that I'm working on right now is that we're, whenever we um, do a query, that we do something called predicate pushdown. Um, see you, Michael. Um, so that we truly only read those chunks of data that are genuinely interesting for us for our query. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. That makes sense. Prometheus has these chunks. That's why I write and I think I once looked at uh, a Prometheus uh, time series database without them and it just took forever to, <laughs> to find the couple of samples I was interested in. So yeah, that will be Will be a fair comparison afterwards, at least. Like still comparing apple and oranges, but I think at least to have like a, a rough idea. Yeah, looking I forward mean, to that. Uh, yeah, r right now, like we know that this is not never going to work, right? I think after having the predicate push down, I think it's going to start to be sort of an apples to apples comparison, or at least, um, you know. <laughs> Even like it, the the only thing that matters is that this one wins at the end, right? <laughs> um, so, like we've we've already pushed the other one almost as far as we thought uh, as we think we could, um, and the the point is that we think we can go way way further with this. All right, awesome. Any um, anything here that anybody wants to have a look at? Like we can also, like everything works. Tables work. Um, flame graphs work. Um, the the one thing that um, is a little bit weird um, is actually units um, because those technically come from uh, from the tables now and not from metadata. Um, so there was something a little bit weird that was kind of hardwired to the previous approach in the UI, and so that's something that we'll just need to. Um, kind of clean up and fix once we do the full transition to this. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I actually saw this yesterday playing around with the new column. So I think uh, maybe just for cl to clarify, like if you go and search again, and then um, in the in the graph, right, it just says fifteen point zero, and we don't yeah. do anything yeah, with the bytes exactly. Yeah, bytes is maybe more interesting yeah. than here. <laughs> Previously, we formatted this to like megabytes or something, right? And this, this is, is I think it should 55 be fifty-five megabytes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just good, good luck the... reading through everything like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, I think that that should be possible to to figure out as well now. Yeah, absolutely. Nice, amazing demo. Right. Um, okay, so next on the agenda, we have 
the position independent executables or should we go for uh, which while uh, agenda points first maybe for change yeah let's go with those first and see if we have enough time we can quickly touch on position independent executables well, do you feel comfortable speaking up and giving a quick uh, description on, on what you said on the the agenda? Yeah, sorry, I lost your audio for a bit there. Are you asking me to speak? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, just wanted to bring a couple of things about the meeting time to your attention that are on the public website. So one thing is the Google Calendar shows uh, 1800 uh, uh, to 1900 on the time without any time zone and i know this meeting started at 1700 utc so uh, that's one thing i wanted to bring to your attention yeah that's a really good and, one uh, <laughs> i take a look and the other one is uh, the time zone checker that's on the website that uh, when is this in your time zone that shows the correct time but it's hard coded to uh, show me 16th November. So ah, that's another thing Um, uh, yeah, the see here what's in your time zone. It I doesn't see, show I the see. next meeting. Yeah, I'm not only. Uh... Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I wasn't speaking. Yeah, I, I guess we would need to update this every single time for every meeting, uh, update this link. So I think basically for that, ignore the, the date, but the, the time zone should be correct. We just need to make sure when everybody moves to summertime, I guess, to change this. So I'm not sure if this I'm even curious. is like a good uh, thing to post on the website now, but rather just have the Google Calendar with the correct time zone uh, posted. Correct. Yeah, I think we can do that. I, I was just curious, maybe we can have a quick look at what the Kubernetes project does because they use these links everywhere. Um, maybe maybe when we copied it, we just made a mistake. I'm, I'm almost certain I added that link. So if that if that is someone's fault, I'm pretty sure it's mine. So that uh, every time zone thing I'm not sure about, but uh, I know that Prometheus uses the Google Calendar that converts uh, the times to your time zone. So that I'm sure of. I don't know about the every time zone thing. All right, we'll, we'll we we can take a look at that and fix that. Thank you so much for bringing that to the attention. That uh, hopefully that hasn't confused people or you know people tried joining without success. Hopefully, yeah, I just went happened. off yesterday's tweet on the Parker Twitter account. I just went off that. Oh yeah, okay. But so th that one worked, is what you're saying? Uh, no, so I just uh, thought that this is the most recent one. So this is what I should follow. Uh, I was confused whether I should follow 1700 UTC or say, uh, whatever 1800 on my time zone. So I went off the great eventually. Okay. Uh, the other okay. thing that I wanted to ask, yeah, Anurag is also saying he hopped in via Twitter. Okay, yeah, great. I, I already looked at the calendar uh, in the community calendar and I fixed it to be 17 UTC going forward. So at least that Google calendar is fixed. Um, but yeah, let, uh, let us know if that still isn't correct for you after this call. Uh, take a quick look and then let us know. Uh, so the other thing I just wanted to confirm was uh, do you have any of, uh, issues that might be code worthy or uh, GitHub, should I raise a GitHub issue? Didn't get the first part of what you were saying. So, for example, I posted a question a couple of days back on the Parker Slack channel. Uh, and it wasn't responded to. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, I guess. I, I would say uh, for everything technical, I think um, GitHub issues is, is the preferred way because it's searchable and people can find everything that um, that everybody posts. So I think that's the, like if you have a bug that you discovered something is panicking and crashing or if there's 
something that um, have like a wrong flag in the documentation or things like that, uh, most certainly post them on GitHub issues. And then um, for the most part, we are actually using Discord. So we have a Parker Discord um, where where we just do one-on-one -on -one interactions and like messages um, with with the community, um, but also everybody from Polar Segments is in there. Um, and yeah, we just had, I think we had the Kubernetes Slack channel way before we had anything else, even for the old uh, project called Comprov. And we just renamed that to to Parker now. Um, and yeah, I think it's kind of like a bit more hands off, but we definitely read it and and every now and then somebody comments, but it's, it's not like the primary channel of communication. Hope that makes Thanks. sense. Thanks. All right. Yeah, but also really good um, to bring it up. I think the Discord server uh, is linked on Parker, if you scroll all the way down, for example, it should be linked um, on there. And then, um, yeah, we can always, I think we can actually just put it to the, to the header in the, in the website as well, because there's GitHub and Twitter, but it doesn't link to the Discord on top. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And um, I, I would say if you're, if you're unsure, just open it in GitHub issue. Like there's absolutely no problem. Like the absolute worst thing that can happen is that people might say, ask it uh, somewhere else, but it's super unlikely that that is going to happen at all. Um, and I would always err on the side of information being searchable, no matter what information it is, then not searchable. So. If you're unsure, just open a GitHub issue. Got it, thanks. Yep, I agree. All right, anything else in, in that realm of topics people wanna ask? How to communicate? I mean, you made it to this call, so that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Frederick, please, I want to quickly mention the position independent executables. Yeah, I, I'll just touch on it because I don't think I can, um, you know, eloquently talk about um, what this, how this works. But um, basically, Kemal, who unfortunately um, couldn't join today, um, he's been working on something really important and re really cool, uh, which is uh, something called position independent executables. And this is most commonly used for things like uh, dynamically linked libraries. So let's say libc, right? The one that basically every program in the world uh, uh, dynamically links to, if, the, if it dynamically links to anything. Um, and that position independent executables are important and interesting because um, like, like their name says, it doesn't matter where in physical memory this um, this executable ends up in, um, you know, like when a, an object file gets mapped into memory by the operating system, um, that may end up anywhere in virtual memory, right? And especially um, dynamic libraries aren't mapped at the beginning of a process mapping. Um, it's not important if you don't know what this means, but the important part is um, position independent executables were kind of a key missing um, part for us to be able to symbolize dynamically linked libraries. Um, and it, as it so happens, um, actually Rust also um, defaults to producing position independent executables, whether it's a dynamically linked library or not. And so the direct consequence of this means that we have much better Rust support now. Um, you basically don't need to use any special um, um, flags to the compiler anymore uh, for the Parka agent to be able to um, gather all of the information that it needs, but also for Parka, for the Parker side to then uh, symbolize those. So that's, um, that's really cool. So, the kind of takeaways are we're better at symbolizing Rust and we're one step closer to 
uh, symbolizing uh, dynamically linked libraries. The kind of last thing that might still still happen um, is that um, code may be compiled using a compiler optimization that um, skips adding frame pointers to uh, stacks. So frame pointers are essentially a pointer at the beginning of um, of a function and the pointer at the at the end of a function. Um, and this is kind of what is generated in the assembly code in compilers uh, so that we can then walk the stack kind of a linked list uh, to figure out what this what the entire stack is that we're looking at. And um, th there's a very evil compiler optimization uh, that skips having this and then if this happens, compilers still add a table where you can still unwind um, stacks, but it's way more complicated. Um, and that's kind of the last thing that might still still happen and might still prevent us from um, capturing stack traces from um, binaries that are compiled to native code. So this is very a very common uh, compiler optimization used in the C++ um, ecosystem, for example. But yeah. So that's basically, as, as far as I understand, and I, as I said, I think Kamal can uh, talk about this much more confidently and much more in detail, but stack unwinding is now kind of the last thing that's missing that we'll be able to um, capture stack traces from basically any native binary. That's that so was, cool. That was uh, I was really looking forward to this feature. Um, and hopefully, yeah, maybe next time or another time, put it that way, another time Kemal can give a demo. And we do have um, on GitHub, we do have um, the Parker, this dash dev slash Parker minus demo. So we have like a Parker demo repository on, on GitHub. Uh, I can drop it in the chat. Um, where we already set up a couple of different uh, language uh, demo applications and there is a Rust one in there. So I'm, I'm rather curious now if I were to run this with the latest development version of Parker agent, um, if this would already work without any of the flags, but hopefully Parker, uh, Kima can come back another time and, and demo this. I think that would be really interesting to see and giving like a, a quick explanation on how it works again. Just like for context, this was like several weeks of work. So like this was not an easy undertaking, but um, and I think Kamal also learned a lot along the way. So I'd be super curious if he has something to share. Would make a great talk for a conference. <laughs> All right. Anything else ever anyone wants to ask, wants to speak about anything we need to fix? in terms of organization <laughs> where we need to, can we do anything better? Now's the time for you to tell us anything you, that's still unclear that we should document better. I guess all of the columnar store will be when merged properly updated in the documentation as well. Um, yeah, there's nothing more going once going twice, then I would say have a great local time and see you in two weeks and hopefully with the correct calendar invite. <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Everyone, everyone. Bye -bye. Bye.